Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack and a second episode featuring the Elan Enterprise computer. If you haven't watched part one yet where we go into why and how this machine came to exist, there's a link on the screen for you to pop off and watch that first if you want to. As we discovered, the Enterprise was lauded as being a technical marvel and many of us as drawling teenagers ogled them for months in the computer press. Now, when we finished the last episode, we had an apparently working machine, but no way of actually using any software on it. I didn't have any tapes with Enterprise software on, and unlike many other retro computers out there, there's not a wealth of modern storage solutions. In fact, I sent out a plea for help to you guys, and you didn't disappoint. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCBWay. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCBWay also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. The first person to contact me was Helga Forster, who sent me a lovely software care package, which contained a new label for the IS Basic cartridge, as the old one was rather tatty. And Helga also sent a tape emulator for the Enterprise, and a load of converted tape files of games, and also some pictures to show what the machine could do graphically. All I had to do to get this going was to take the output of the PC sound card to the input of the Enterprise and then load the virtual cassette and press the play button on the tape emulator. And then as far as the Enterprise is concerned, it's hooked up to an actual tape player. Very nice, and thanks very much Helga. This helped me to confirm that the machine was fully working, and more on that IS Basic label and cartridge later. I then joined the Enterprise Forever forums, which although for the most part is in Hungarian, thanks to Google Translate I can make my way around quite nicely. And there's a wealth of valuable information in there. Down the rabbit hole I went, and thanks to everyone who posts stuff in there. It's proved very useful on this journey. Next shout out goes to Mark Garnett, who sent me a note informing me of all manner of wonderful things to do with the Enterprise, including the EX-DOS IDE floppy interface and the replica designed by the user Pear on the Enterprise Forever forums. I knew immediately that was something I wanted a part of, and there's more from Pear also, who's a very clever bunny. And finally for now, Richard Elvin, who I bumped into at a retro fair and who sent me some other goodies to try out, including a memory expansion and an SD card solution. That's coming up later too. Final thanks go to PCBWay for reasons which will become increasingly obvious as we go through this episode, which, to be honest, has been a bit of a labour of love, as surely anyone in their right mind wouldn't have embarked on any of this. And I'm only at the end of this chain of madness because I'm just putting the pieces together that other much cleverer and even more crazy folk have spent their time and hard earned money designing and building in the first place. So let's begin at the beginning, the keyboard. So what's up with the keyboard I hear you cry? Well, the simple fact is that as soon as I open the machine up to take a look inside, the keyboard stopped working. And that's because the keyboard matrix in these machines is prone to failure after all this time, so we need to replace that. And luckily, you can still buy new ones for around the 30 pound mark. So not cheap, but in our case, definitely necessary. The rubber mat, which acts as the spring for the keys and is responsible for that spongy typing experience that keyboards of this nature have, looks to be in pretty good shape. So no need to replace that. There's also a clue that someone's been in here before because there's supposed to be a red rubber ring that acts as a damper for the joystick and I can't see that anywhere. So we've had to get one of those too. 
Reaching underneath, we'll carefully pull the Matrix ribbon cables out of their sockets. We don't want to assume they're broken, even though I'm 99% certain this will need replacing. There's always a slim chance it just needs a clean. But no, there's a clear break in the contacts here, and I'm guessing that's just where the trace, being only a thin film, has stuck to the connector when this has been previously removed. The other cable is also quite badly creased and bent where someone has tried to force it into the socket, so we'll definitely need that replacement matrix. As I mentioned, this was around £30 delivered from a seller on Sell My Retro, and it looks like a nice quality piece, which, given good care and attention, should see this enterprise through another 30 years or so. So let's put all of this back together and see if we're back to a working keyboard. And don't worry, I did pop back and put that rubber ring in when it arrived. Right, let's power up the machine and see if everything works. It's always a bit annoying when you have to do work just to get you back to where you were at the start, but in this case, I'm choosing to believe that it was only a matter of time until we would have had to change that membrane anyway. So at least this way, it's already done. And all of the keys seem to be working a treat. Okay, what next? One of the things that Richard Elvin sent in was this one megabyte memory upgrade, although completely bereft of instructions or information, and Richard did want this back. So I thought, rather than start with this, let's pop back down the rabbit hole again, and as it turns out, there are a number of memory expansions that have been designed over the years, and several of those had schematics and Gerber files available. So I settled on one of the later ones, designed by Elmer in the Enterprise, Prize Forever forums, and it's an expansion of 1536k, which, when combined with the Enterprise's built in 64k, should, quick bit of maths, give us 1600k of memory total. As the parts were surface mount, I decided to give PCBWay's full build service a go. I sent them the Gerber files and the parts list, PCBWay sent through some pictures of the prototype, and I gave the go-ahead, and voila, a few days later, five of these bad boys arrived. And the quality is excellent, and they're exactly as the pictures showed. Now, they're wrong, but that's not PCBWay's fault, that's entirely mine. If I'd paid more close attention, I would have realised that I'd asked for the EXP1 headers to be placed on top, where they in fact need to be on the bottom. I'd also agreed to the EXP2 headers being straight, when in fact space limitations inside the case means that these need to be right angle pins. Well, that's nothing that a bit of time with the old soldering station can't sort out, but I am glad I didn't order a thousand of them. I've only got five to correct, so it won't take long to fix. While the soldering iron is out, we need to install the female headers to the mainboard of the Enterprise, ready to accept the memory. For some reason, the pinholes are all filled with solder from the factory, perhaps to dissuade people from fiddling around, but nevertheless, we need to remove that old solder. A dab of fresh solder on each, and we're soon ready to use the sucker to clear the holes. With the headers installed on the mainboard, we can pop the memory in and wire it up, and then I guess we'll see if it works. And the answer to that is sort of, but not really, well, in fact, not at all. We can see here from this diagnostic screen that we have a bad 1536K, but at least it does recognise that there is 1536K. And then Enterprise Basic reports that we have 1572864 bytes, that's 1536K, not working. A quick check showed I'd actually completely failed to solder one of the pins on the header, and that was a two second fix. So it appears we now have not an Enterprise 64, but an Enterprise 1600, as Enterprise Basic is showing 1638400 bytes free. That's the full 1600K. Nice. What next? Okay, so as I mentioned, when researching the machine, I became aware of the EX-DOS floppy disk interface that was available around launch, but they're very rare to find. 
but Mark Garnett made me aware of the Replica EX-DOS project by Pair and thus began a three month process to build one. PCBWay again supplied the PCBs from the Gerber files on Pair's EX-DOS page and whilst there is a bill of materials available, some of it wasn't totally and immediately clear and it took some time to source all of the parts, including this quite expensive WD1772 controller, which annoyingly I bought before realising that it's the same controller that I have sitting in two spare part Atari STs. Don't. Anyway, the result of three months scouring for parts and figuring everything out has resulted in this, my own replica EX-DOS floppy disk interface, coupled up to this GoTech drive with the latest flash floppy firmware. Let's see how it works. Well, firstly, let's turn on the EX-DOS interface, which will supply power to and boot the GoTech firmware. And then we'll power on the enterprise itself. And in doing so, we get an early indication that the machine has recognized the interface because we can see the green light on the GoTech drive come on briefly. Pressing a button to get past the splash screen and we see the GoTech get accessed again before we're dumped unceremoniously into our standard basic ready prompt. All of the commands to navigate the disk operating system are done from within EX-DOS itself, which we access by typing colon EX-DOS. Typing DIR asks us to insert a disk in drive A. The GoTek drive has an image selected, so we press enter and we get a listing of the drive contents. Very nice. To change the disk, much like with all other machines that use a GoTek, we simply have to change the image on the drive itself using our rotary controller. We can then issue another DIR command on the enterprise and we're now looking at a listing of the new disk. All commands for manipulating disks, formatting, copying, etc. are all done within the EX-DOS interface. But this isn't where you load and save from. For that, we need to go back to basic. And to do that, we issue the command colon basic. Now, to load and save anything to or from any media on the enterprise, we use the load and save commands. There's a pecking order to what the machine will try and use this load command on. If you don't have EX-DOS, it will think you want to use a cassette recorder. If you've got a disk drive attached, the enterprise will presume you want to use that. So typing loadhero.com has bypassed the cassette system completely and just gone straight to the disk interface to look for the file on the currently inserted disk. And whilst we have a little play on this, it's worth noting how quick it was to load. I think this EX-DOS interface really opens up the machine to being something really usable, especially now we have all that lovely memory to play around with too. Whilst I was building this interface, I also took the time to take this rather tatty Enterprise Basic cartridge and printed myself a new label courtesy of Helga. It turned out really well, so thanks for that. Okay, memory done, disk interface done, surely there's one other thing. Ah yes, the SD card interface. Now, it's a shame I can't seem to find one of these for sale anywhere, or indeed find the designs or schematics to make my own, as not only is it a really neat package, this cartridge also has multiple ROMs on it. So as well as the SD interface, it's also got EX-DOS, basic, word processors, diagnostics, all sorts of goodies. But for now, let's just take a look at how easy this is to use. After inserting it into the machine, we power on, and anyone who's familiar with DivMMC on the ZX Spectrum will find this refreshingly similar, with the system creating several virtual devices, one of which is the SD card we just inserted. Once we're in IS Basic, we can push the Function 1 key to issue the command Start, which will look for and run a program called Start should it exist in the default file system, in our case, the SD card. That brings up this friendly navigation screen through which we can decide what program we want to run and then load it. Speedwise, there doesn't seem to be much in it between the SD interface and the EX-DOS disk interface. Both are very quick and very usable. 
I'm going to keep digging around on this SD card interface solution to see if there are other alternatives available. And if not, I'm quite happy anyway with the EX DOS interface. What I need from all of you out there in enterprise land is to tell me about some amazing software that will really showcase what this machine can do with all of this memory and storage capability. I'm tempted to switch to the word processor on this machine just for a while to write the scripts for the episodes and give my trusty BBC Model B a break. There are links in the description to most of the things we've looked at today and if you know of anything else out there for this machine, please let me know in the comments or get in touch via email. Thanks again to PCBWay for all of their help with this episode and I really can't recommend them enough for small production runs. The full build service was around £200 for five fully populated PCBs along with all of the spare components from the minimum order quantities and that includes shipping also. That's around £40 per unit and I think that's great value. Thanks also to Helga, Mark and Rich, I'm going to be sending each of you one of these memory upgrades for your own machines as a thanks for pointing me in the right direction. And of course, none of this would have been possible were it not for the creators of these wonderful designs in the first place. Elmer for the memory upgrade, Pear for the EX DOS interface, and also this programmable cartridge which I'm toying with at the moment. And of course, the maker of the SD card interface, whose name I won't attempt to pronounce, but whose site is linked in the description. Thank you all. And thanks to all of you lovely viewers for coming along on this journey with us. If you like the video, please help to promote the channel by subscribing and hitting the like button, which helps YouTube to notice us and recommend us to other viewers. Please let us know in the comments if you've embarked on any of this, and of course, keep those recommendations and suggestions coming in. Time to take this enterprise to strange new worlds now, so second star to the right, and straight on till morning, if you will, Mr. Chekhov. <laughs>